And now the Omega Institute is proud to introduce <laughs> Terence McKenna. <laughs> In the red tights. And Ralph Abraham in the faded denims. <laughs> and the rules of the game are uh, simple indeed. Uh, one of us will talk for a bit, then the other will talk for a bit. It's called getting a word in edgewise, that's what my mother used to say. <laughs> Then we'll both talk for a bit, and then you'll be invited to ask questions for a bit. And uh, the topic is uh, uh, the World Wide Web, the Internet, and the Millennium. Well, the Millennium is, is uh, uh, simply a speed bump in our calendar which is an artificial timekeeping construction that is the largest frame in which our culture operates. The Internet is a technological artifact. The literal exteriorization of the human nervous system brought into being by forces of big science and big capitalism and big military strategic thinking and now in the service of a global information marketplace. And it, it uh, like all new technologies, is the focus of fantastic hopes and fantastic amounts of hypola. Uh, the Internet seems particularly uh, to draw this kind of extreme rhetoric to itself because it seems to many people, whether they consciously realize it or not, to be the fulfillment of an almost religious agenda. This is a, a platonic superspace. Uh, we can fling the defiled body away and become archons of a kind of new informational Gnosticism and shed our connections to the material world and move off into a domain of platonic perfection under the rule of art and law. Uh, it's a grand Faustian dream, a very deep strain in the in the Western psyche that uh, that cyberspace appeals to and indeed seems to make manifest. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it raises all kinds of challenges to all the values that have been created in the past because the past 500 years has been about the exploration of the, of the print-created space uh, that McLuhan called public space, the space of rational discourse and academic dialogue and democratic deliberation. That space is being collapsed, remolded, transformed by the internet, which seems to be more uh, anarchical and less hierarchical, more uh, the fringes are thrown into high relief by the political processes favored by the internet, rather than a molding of consensus through single-minded devotion to special cultural icons, the internet empowers unbelievable diversity and abandonment of any effort at building consensus or indeed polity or community at all. Uh, so the, the chance met or synchronistic occurrence of the millennial turning and the rise of the internet uh, is a, a fertile area for uh, discussion and speculation. The entirety of the 20th century was, uh, you know, it may be remembered as the informational century or the pre-digital era. Uh, all the technologies that now go into the Internet were perfected under the umbrella of modernism with uh, its, its marriage of big science to market forces and that sort of thing. The 
simple search for entertainment and money seems to have ushered in a whole pantheon of strange genies that now beckon with pseudo forms of immortality, gender bending forms of sexuality, uh, strange new dimensions of information and control that the internet sets up. I mean, it's a brand new world out there, folks. It's uh, as profound a shift in cultural values as the introduction of the phonetic alphabet or urbanization uh, or something like that. And because the turn of the millennium uh, wants to insist itself around an agenda the way an oyster insists itself around a piece of grit to make a pearl, inevitably uh, the obsession of the new century is some combination of the internet, nanotechnological engineering, biotechnological engineering, uh, all of these uh, new technologies united under the theme of information, transformation of information. And, and so what seems to be dawning is an entirely new set of social and cosmological values where information is primary, more primary than gravity or light or matter. Uh, information somehow precedes all of that. Life cannot be life without the inherent information uh, in DNA. Physics cannot be physics without the information carrying capacity of the electromagnetic field. Information is recognized as primary and language then, both human languages and computer languages in a constant state of evolution become the carriers of some kind of eschatological hope. So I'll just bring this to a close by saying, I think try as we might to trivialize the Internet and its relationship to the millennium, that really one is the new archon that the other heralds and predicts, that the, the occult dreams of Gnosticism and alchemy and hermetic thought the idea that man, rather than being a fallen creature, could be some kind of co-partner uh, in the enterprise of creation, that particular strain of fantasy gets an enormous shot in the arm from the rise of cyberspace, the informational technologies and the power to manipulate them, the power to steer human history toward a world of ever greater art and artifice with all the contradictions and, uh, and ambiguities that that necessarily uh, would entail. So that's my take on where we are at the millennium with the Internet. And now for a counterpoint of just plain talk. <laughs> I, uh, well, Ter Terence and I have touched on these topics uh, before, and we are in pretty much fundamental agreement, not because of arguing with each other, but just as a process of, I would say, convergent evolution, uh, thinking about our discussions on mathematical topics uh, 25 years ago or more when we began, there was a larger difference between our positions. Um, and maybe I didn't listen perfectly, but let me uh, paraphrase as I, uh, what I got, Terence, was the millennium is a speed bump on the highway of evolution, and the World Wide Web is a really big deal that I think you've described some of its uh, potential features really well. So I might, um, if I got that right, address an imbalance by giving just a little bit more attention to the millennium. Okay, the millennium, I think, uh, I haven't thought about it at all as the year 2000 any more than there was another one in the year 1000. But I think the millennium means, uh, to me, it means a big change between two 
plateaus, more or less, in a style of evolution of culture or society which is similar to biological evolution and having quantum leaps of new species and stuff like that. And there is, of course, in historiography, a continuity theory that goes back to Leibniz, if not before. Uh, we are under the influence in our so-called modern age of a continuous theory of history, whereas before Leibniz, a couple hundred years ago, there was more uh, of a feeling of quantum leaps in evolution as far as world cultural history is concerned. If one of these quantum leaps coincided with the year 2000, that would be most coincidental. And I'm not against such coincidences. That would be okay. But thinking of the Renaissance as a model, the Renaissance is a smaller quantum leap of... I don't want to use that word quantum. I hate it, come to think of it. A big jump in the <laughs> development of all that we consider ourselves now occurred in the Renaissance, and we think that the one we're in now is bigger. But the, the one in the Renaissance was smaller. Keep in mind that it did not coincide with any particular year, the beginning or end of even a century. And the, no matter how tight you make the sudden jump, it still took at least a century. Nothing happened in a year or two or three. Now, I believe we're in a really big one, and that's arguable, but accepting that for the sake of discussion, we can say, well, what supports this, or what is a part of it, or what is uh, changing? Well, there's the expected and long postponed meltdown of the world economy. There are the, the thousand and one catastrophes on the litany of the doomsday book. You know what I mean, the ozone hole. Um, population, the global climate warming, the growth of the, the melting of the iceberg, the rise of the, you know, all of those, there's a million things uh, which are sudden transformations and yet there always have been. So what have we got to offer here under the heading of bigger than a speed bump on the, the path of progress? So certainly the World Wide Web has to be counted in evidence, uh, especially if it's as significant as we've described it. Then it is, at least it's evidence for, so it's under the heading of uh, a millennial leap with or without the year 2000. We have evidence of a millennial leap because the World Wide Web is happening so rapidly. In fact, it's part of the computer evolution which is happening so rapidly. In fact, all of this stuff... Uh, airplanes and uh, the telegraph and trains and the steam engine, all of this is within the span of a century. Uh, my father rode on one of the first planes. And so we could say that this uh, a whole period of a century, more or less, is a big jump. And in that sense, it is larger than the World Wide Web. Or, or is it? That's, that's the question. The other evidence. Well, okay, Terence, you described the World Wide Web a little. You even invoked his name, McLuhan, and I think that you gave a kind of a McLuhan esque version of it. And certainly that is one aspect that it is a new medium. It's a medium of communication, it connects human beings in different places with a high speed network, and in that it is. Uh, new in the same sense that the Gutenberg Bible was new, as you suggested. This medium transformation, uh, um, we, we know the discovery of the alphabet and so on, this always heralded a gigantic leap in the evolution of culture. But uh, we are also thinking, under the name Information Age, that the World Wide Web is more than a medium. It is more than the connection of my information with yours. It is more than is it, or what do you think? I think it is more than the completion of the telegraph telephone revolution. The World Wide Web is to the Internet as answering machines are to the telephone network. And yet, it is more if there is information in it, which is more than connecting together in a web the information that already existed. You see what I mean? Is there or isn't there cyber information which could only exist after the construction of this new technological piece. 
No, I think there is. There's no way to justify this. And again, Terence, you used the word, the Gnostic, whatever you said. Uh, we feel that, and, and have uh, discussed a couple of years ago, I think, uh, the idea that there is a spiritual side, believe it or not, to the World Wide Web, in spite of the fact that these engineers, these nerds, have put together these nuts and bolts and so on. And that is that the World Wide Web is an expression in peculiar form, in a kind of a mechanical form, of the spiritual aspirations of ancient times. So Houston Smith is discussing the concepts from ancient wisdom which are applicable today and as if we would consciously learn them and apply them and here is a similar idea inverted, is upside down and it says that the spiritual wisdom of the ages is materializing itself through the recruitment unconsciously of otherwise innocent and unconscious nerds, computer engineers and hackers such as myself recruiting them to a higher purpose and creating something of spiritual importance while everybody on the planet thinks it's other than what it is, which is, I shouldn't even be telling you this, it's other than it is, so that it wouldn't be attacked and destroyed by the backlash reflex of our civilization, of, of our species, which always tends to destroy advancing things, like Wilhelm Reich said in his essay on the emotional plague. That's the millennium, another view on the millennium as the bigger thing in the World Wide Web. Oh, th this is the question then that we're posing. Is the World Wide Web one of a long list of things which are evidence for the fact that a big leap is happening now? We have to know the answer to that question or pretend that we do because in these special times when a big leap is happening, we have enormous power, we have leverage, as Archimedes said, give me a lever and I'll move the world. We have the leverage to really influence the creation of the future through small deeds, through meeting here tonight, through discussing in this way, through saying a certain magic word might be enough, according to the butterfly theory of catastrophe theory, of, of chaos theory, the butterfly effect. It might be enough to swing things, whereas if we were in a plateau, a thousand year period between the quantum leaps then wouldn't matter what we did so we might as well go and get rich and invent pet rocks and stuff so it, it, it is I think an important question whether we're at a, a leap or not and I'll call that millennium although that's between the thousand year periods could be any time you know what I mean if we were between 100 year periods that's a smaller jump that's not what I'm talking I'm talking about like a big one okay, we're, like, we're in a big one or are we not and the World Wide Web is just part of the evidence, along with the atomic bomb that Jose Arguello says that was the beginning of the atomic age and everybody has a different theory. Or is it uh, that the millennium is a speed bump along a development curve where the main leap is the World Wide Web? This way or this way? Or are they, in fact, uh, as I said in my joke at the beginning, the World Wide Web... Or is it the millennium? Are they, in fact, the same? Well, first of all, let me point out that the real, the millennium is 18 months away. So we're assuming that we already have in our sights the big event which defines what it will be. But in fact, in the next 18 months, something could jump out of the woodwork that would completely reshuffle the deck. I felt like at one point in your talk, you came very close to implying that what this was all about was the production of a kind of AI of some sort. That, what, that the big story is not the World Wide Web, it's that the World Wide Web is a spawning nest for artificial intelligences of some sort. No, for a spiritual intelligence. It contains the wisdom of the age. The last thing that you expect to find in the heart of a machine is spiritual wisdom. Just suppose that's what it's there for. Well, if you have a Gnostic view of things, then you can imagine that the spirit that would arise in the soul of a machine would actually be a messenger from the higher and hidden 
all father beyond the pleroma of natural law and that in a sense we had created our own ticket back out of the iron prison of the world and that it was done by being self-swallowed through the Gnostic imagination realized in virtual cyberspace or something like that. <laughs> you know. uh, I, I do think that without intending to, we, we make the web more and more friendly to the sudden emergence of, of organized artificial intelligence. And we don't know what this will look like. We don't know whether that's a fantastic fantasy, like me writing on a map, uh, here there be dragons, or whether in fact that's a perfectly reasonable fear that autonomous non-equilibrium processes running in these enormously complex electronic systems will evolve self-sustaining strategies and other behaviors that will look weirdly like strategic intelligence uh, to us. Uh, I don't feel much paranoia about this. Uh, there are people who daily go to work in Silicon Valley engaged in what they call the great work. And the great work they're referring to is handing over the project of intelligence to organisms fast enough and efficient enough and deep enough in their logic to actually appreciate the enterprise. So, you know, in a way, are we designing our own prostheses or are we designing some kind of uh, uh, Promethe new Prometheus, as Mary, Fra Mary Shelley subtitled uh, her novel Frankenstein? Uh, you know, what is this, what is the nature of information, both genetic information and then this information which we code and hack with such facility in one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, four. I mean, uh, after all, what is, what is molecular engineering except three-dimensional code hacking? Uh, when you're in well, you're doing all too well at the destruction of my fantasy about the World Wide Web, implying with infinite subtleness that I'm uh, essentially a UFO abductee in disguise. <laughs> Do you remember those days? Do you remember those days when people were tuning the radio between two stations and then you would hear another station coming in that was from another planet or a spacecraft or something and people were <laughs> looking in their auto radio dials while driving along for these secret spots and uh, passing along the code numbers to find them on the underground. So uh, I admit that my positive fantasy about the World Wide Web is a little bit like uh, either that or worse, the spacecraft suddenly appearing over all the major cities and ordering us to change our ways. Uh, what I've said is, I admit it, it's an indefensible fantasy, and, and it's just one of those wish things where, um, okay, if you build it, they will come. So we'll build the World Wide Web, and then we will miraculously find, I guess it sounded like that, we'll find some ancient spiritual wisdom that is somehow peeking out from behind a bush there in virtual reality. And uh, that's not exactly what I meant, but I was thinking more along this line, that we are tired of reductionism. We give lip service to uh, general systems, holism, and all that. We do believe that there's more sense in the whole than in the sum of the parts. And if the, the parts are us, are the, what is it, 5.3 billion people on planet Earth or something. Just say if. And uh, if the sum of the parts is the world as we know it now, and then the whole thing, if it were interconnected, would, uh, would achieve a higher intelligence, where the higher intelligence would be whatever that was, which might not be so high, which might be the devil finally let loose. That's what Terence, uh, that's how I read between the, the words, um, there is, I do not believe in artificial intelligence in the sense that you described in the Great Project. I th I'm expecting a higher intelligence there. I just use those words. And I'm not thinking of it having anything to do with AI or anything that engineers make. It is something which is inherent in the totality 
of the World Wide Web, as in the connectionist view of neurophysiology, the brain with its various capabilities of uh, doing uh, idiosavant, doing large sum arithmetic, um, it has these capabilities that the parts can't have and the sum of parts is only when you connect them up that you can really achieve a higher purpose and this is what Teilhard de Chardin was talking about except his idea was there okay we prepare for this not by buying um, the Windows 95 computer we prepare for this according to Teilhard de Chardin by doing spiritual exercises alone by doing Tai Chi by the lake and after a few years of this, we have a kind of breakthrough, and then we are, find ourselves automatically connected to other like people. And when enough pe people reach this breakthrough, if they ever do, because they keep dying before they've got there because they postponed to have another chocolate bar, and then, <laughs> if we could, it'd be like, remember the Maharishi effect? Is this too long ago to, for people to remember? Where he said, if a hundred people did it together, they, but then, you know, and they tried it and there wasn't enough effect. So they said, if a hundred groups of a hundred people, so okay, 10,000 people. So they tried it. They got 10,000 meditators to go to Providence, Rhode Island, when it was the most crime-ridden city in the United States. And they actually decreased the crime rate for three days, and then they went home. So it's this kind of thing. This caress in that science fiction book, Cat's Cradle, you know what I mean? And uh, th that kind of thing was the expectation of salvation, a, a miracle that would save us. A, a, when was, he died in 1962 or something. So as recently as uh, 40 years ago, that this was the expectation. We would do it with spiritual power alone. Do what? Connect up. Connect up into what? Higher intelligence. Uh, with a power of good to solve at least a few problems so we could have a future. Now, say, okay, meditation didn't do it, so let's try a little fiber optics. By any means necessary, we have to communicate. And if it can be done by the occult method or the spiritual method or by telegraphy, telephony, computers, whatever it is, it's, what we've done is we've built a world civilization on so flimsy a medium as small mouth noises. Without even a telephone book. Without a global telephone book. Yeah. And now, and now we've got one. To we've manage got all Vista. of this, we must quickly clarify and refine our communications. And we are. The, the good news is the primate responds to pressure and again and again, like some kind of deus ex machina in a medieval miracle play, technology stumbles on stage to pluck our chestnuts out of the fire. And it won't be different this time, apparently, even though the but stakes the technology are dramatically only higher only has this positive potential because it's been created on demand of a higher purpose, not a conductor of the spiritual orchestra, but some kind of pattern above. You could put it like this. That, you know, I know that um, you're not keen on all so-called paranormal or parapsychological stuff, but I think uh, Dean Radin in his book The Conscious Universe makes a very good case that a lot of these things are, in fact, real phenomenon and they're like part-time kind of phenomenon and hard to nail them down but statistically significant on the level of a million million to one or something like huge evidence in favor of telepathy uh, influencing random number generators and so if the, we can influence the random number generator by thought power alone maybe can also influence us now if we give up the idea that the mind is in the brain I'll come back to the World Wide Web in the millennium in a minute. The mind isn't in the brain. Are neurophysiologists wasting their time? No. I think that the structure of the brain, neurophysiology, and the structure of the mind, wherever it is, diffuse out in a cloud somewhere, a nimbus cloud, with an inner structure which is similar enough to the structure of the brain so that they can resonate and more or less exchange ideas by a kind of communication, which is another way of connecting us all up is by individual connections to the oversoul, a big pancake in the sky. So if there, and we don't have any other theory for the scientific results of parapsychology, we might as well assume, like Emerson, and throw a pancake in the sky, the oversoul, and then that intelligence, whatever is there, can manifest through anybody who 
remember when we found out that the creative people in the computer industry were all taking LSD? So, or doing Buddhist meditation, it's the fastest growing religion in America, and these people are maybe they're connected enough so that what they chose to do was in conformity a little bit roughly more than random in conformity with a higher plan which is to connect us up more for good than for evil. Well, this is a long shot. Well, connect connectivity seems to be the rule of nature. It's always been about the business of building connectivity, and it but it just keeps raising the stakes higher and higher. And now the scales in time at which these this progress in the connectivity project proceeds, it's moving so rapidly that we can actually see it in our own lifetimes. At one point, it was a geological process, then a, then a uh, morphological process expressed through natural selection and mutation. Now it's an epigenetic process, a cultural process, and uh, the millennium is simply a, a, an, uh, an excuse to notice that this ramping up effect is happening and and the internet seems to be just the the further progress toward this inevitable coextensive domain of connectivity that's going to link everything to everything and make ordinary reality somehow obsolete and the whole process is epiphanous you know it's a it's a it's a hierophany it's an unfolding of the of the intent of of deity or of nature or something like that. It's extremely... Uh, a natural process of evolution, as it was, and I think explosive evolution in the sense that with changes, things are added, not subtracted. I do not think that cyberspace is going to replace ordinary reality, but only sit above it in a supplementary fashion, expanding the dimensions of ordinary existence. And the reason to have several parallel systems is this. Well, let's say we don't need, if the World Wide Web were a medium only, in the sense of Marshall McLuhan, then it is not too important because we already have telepathy, but maybe it's more. And one kind of information that it's got is the index, the indices, the search engines. Whereas maybe in telepathy is an ephemeral process. I... I got the message that my dog is hungry and I should go home, but I don't remember the message from yesterday and the day before, you see. But the World Wide Web, like an answering machine or email, it remembers all these things. And then its memory can be indexed with a robot indexer. And nobody, I don't remember any spiritual teacher from the ancient world in India who said that in the Akashic Record there was an altavista.com. No mention of indices for the Akashic Record. You had to go, like, dig around there. Since everything that ever happened is remembered, it's a hell of a dig. So now I think that um, that's just the lowest level of information in the World Wide Web is its index. And that is something that's added on. So if we have spiritual purpose, morality, and ethics in the spiritual web based on telepathy, and we have indices and nothing more in the, in the spiritual web that cons- consists of the medium of the World Wide Web together with its uh, 30 million repositories, then we've got more. We've got, we've gained, you see. And uh, this is the lowest level of the utopian fantasy for the World Wide Web. Gain. Well, yes. I mean, for example, you know, returning to the theme of information, uh, as you know, or should know, there's a revolution taking place now in quantum physics where people are having to admit the existence of a kind of non-local domain of connectivity called Bell space, where all points in the universe seem to be somehow connected to each other. And it seems to me that this offers a physical explanation for the otherwise evolutionarily somewhat difficult to account for phenomenon of the human fantastic imagination. Uh, 
In other words, it doesn't really fulfill any evolutionary agenda. Why do we spend so much of our time in uh, fantasies and dreams and reveries and altered states of consciousness? It may be that our minds are like antenna extending into a, a dimension that links all parts of the universe together coextensively. Well, the bad news from that scenario is we can only know informationally about these other parts of the universe. We can never go there. But interestingly, we are growing toward accepting information alone as the coinage of reality. So suppose there are, that in the human imagination there are aliens whispering secrets that are, are the secrets of civilizations that evolved in other galaxies and distant star systems. We will never be able to touch the alien flesh, but if under the name of the enterprise of art we attempt to build websites as alien as we possibly can to build virtual realities for our own edification that are as alien as we can possibly make them. Halfway through that process, I would bet you would discover that you were essentially engaged in an automatic writing process with an alien intelligence uh, at the other end. In other words, in a sense, the World Wide Web is a potential landing zone for a creature or an intelligence made purely of information. And I would bet to you, given our own present stage of evolution and our flirtation with digital existence, that all advanced forms of intelligence exist purely or optionally as nothing more than information. So in a way, the World Wide Web, the metaphor may be more apt than we imagined. It's a web, and what you catch in it is an alien mind that cannot nest in the presence of the human family in any other environment other than that kind of a digital labyrinth. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, but it's, it's really hard to see how it's going to get through there and be recognized. Say, okay, he's up there. He's saying, okay, I just really can't talk to you until you develop VRML. Like, would you just, you know, get those guys busy? And um, when the thing reaches a sufficiently sophisticated level of density, of connection, of hardware, of software, and so on, then the landing will take place. Then it'll be like... Um, I know you're not not a great fan of uh, crop circles, but say <laughs> it appeared in cyberspace, sort of cyber crop circles. And they waved their hands. Say, okay, well, you, you were waiting. You asked to speak with us. The alien mind has landed, and now lend me your ears. You say, oh God, this crop circle phenomenon again. You must be kidding. And I say, yeah, we 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 tried once before, and you couldn't hear us. And uh, you said that you really needed a lot of. Uh, high-tech apparatus in order to take us seriously. So we built this landing craft you call the World Wide Web. And uh, here we are again. And we said, no, no, take it away. Yes, well, they'll keep coming at us until we recognize them. Uh, the real issue with alien intelligence is knowing when you have it in front of you because it is alien, you know. I mean, the... the this, this is why the pro bono proctologists from nearby star systems scenario doesn't work for me because anybody with that intimate an interest in the tenderer portions of my anatomy is not alien enough for my taste. Thank you. I think you'd be due for an abduction, Terence, but probably you've already had one. You're in denial. <laughs> I'm sure, given sufficient therapy under the right hands, we could confirm <clears throat> I think we need some help. Here. I think maybe we need I some help. I warned them. Shall yeah. I sum up before we throw it over? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, we ran the gauntlet from A to Z here. Uh, World Wide Web as uh, extension of your checking account to landing zone for alien intelligence, uh, apocalyptic breakthrough, or uh, you know, trivial more techno work.
worship. Ralph and I pretty much come from the same school of theology on this because we're very netted in. I couldn't live as I live in Hawaii without the net. I mean, I I have tried to live a, a kind of existence that I felt was a model for the future. And so what that meant was living in nature up a four-wheel drive road, no power lines coming in, nothing like that but with the one megabyte wireless connection. So no paradox or dichotomy or contradiction in that. That's how we all should live, is off-grid and as deeply wired into the collectivity as we can be so that we can participate in in building the collective consensus for a human uh, and humane future. And the millennium and the web, I think, are factors which perhaps synchronistically are juxtaposed, but for whatever reason, they synergize each other and push the process of, of novelty and advance uh, to ever greater heights. So what do you yes. think? <laughs> Anybody, don't be shy. Who's going to be the caller? Oh, I don't know. Why don't you do it for a while? Okay. I'll start in the front, but I will go back fast. Yeah, hi. Um, come the millennium. Um, all the clocks tick over zero, zero. There's a lot of talk about the millennium bug. Do you think this could uh, scupper the whole World Wide Web with various systems crashing? Will it survive that phenomena? Is that going to happen? Oh, this is Terence's specialty, is Y2K. Well, not really, uh, but on the novelty list, there's been a lot of talk about it. And it's strange, because I am have chicken littleism uh, of several varieties, but my intuition on this one is to sit tight, and that, uh, and that we have plenty of... Uh, well, I don't know, maybe I'm so sanguine because I live in Hawaii... Uh, but I wouldn't want to be in central Manhattan when the electrical grid on the eastern seaboard hit the floor with no chance of ever coming up again. (laughs) This sort of thing is predicted. What you need to do is just, like all the rest of us, read the list, stay tuned to the Internet. There are central pages coordinating the effort to fix this problem. If it does rip our world asunder, it certainly will be ironic. You know, it wasn't melting polar ice caps. It wasn't asteroid impact. It wasn't those pesky grays. It wasn't Ebola virus. It was none of that. It was bad Fortran written (laughs) 30 years ago. Anyway, you want to add to that? Uh, No, I want to go on. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Yes, that's... um, uh, let's just take that as a suggestion that in parallel with the, the Gnostic inspiration of the World Wide Web is the possibility of a Buddhist inspiration of the World Wide Web because as a matter of fact it seems to somehow uh, embody basic principles in its very being and uh, I would say this is compatible with my fantasy that people who built the World Wide Web did so under not only an extraordinary impulse of altruism but also some kind of spiritual connection which could have been the result of a spiritual exercise connection to a guru or just something that happened uh, without their participation but it seems as if it came about with a purpose especially the early web uh, beginning in 1991 or 1992 was just the epitome of altruism where people without pay created wrote software, gave it away for free, and so on, and and made this uh, possible for all of us. Uh, Yeah, just in the interest of thoroughness, um, I read McLuhan's letters a few years ago, and, you know, McLuhan had a very interesting intellectual history. He was a Joyce scholar and eventually a convert to Catholicism. And uh, in one of his letters, he he talks about the four ages of the of Christianity as the age of the Old Testament God 
which ends with the birth of Christ, the second era of Christianity as the era of the Son, uh, uh, the, Christ, the era of the Christos, and the third era of Christianity, the, the age of the Holy Ghost. And he directly connected the idea of the Holy Ghost to the idea of electricity. And he thought of the sanctification of the Holy Ghost as the world wrapped in electric light, essentially, and communication technology. So it's interesting that these Jesuits and those they educate have this deep strain of techno-mysticism as one, uh, one intellectual option available to them. And the other thing is that I, I feel that the Internet is, is also, at the same time, doing all the things that you say and predict that it's doing, is also uh, drawing uh, more boundaries between the haves and the have-nots because, and creating uh, uh, additional, additional, let's say, political and economic tensions in our, in our country and elsewhere, and possibly globally, I can't read that, but uh, I feel that there is a, uh, you know, a, uh, a, 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 I feel there is a threat in that direction, that, the, the, uh, dis- that there is a lot of disenfranchisement because of uh, what the, the, the people like us in this room and here in the United States in, at certain levels can do and the, the, the rest of the world cannot do. Yes, quite right. Well, au contraire. (laughs) Quite wrong. If the curve of development of the modern automobile had followed the same curve of development as the modern computer, the modern automobile would now cost $50.00 and it would go 500,000 miles on a gallon of gas, and a gallon of gas would cost a nickel. But it's still uh, half the world's population doesn't have electricity. We don't have an instant cure for that. Right, but the cost at which basic computational machinery has fallen from R&D to market saturation is faster than any product that's ever been introduced. So we're doing the very best we can. I don't think you understand, you know, the first computers uh, in the early 1950s cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and they couldn't do what uh, uh, today's desktop computer can do by far. The no, computer is, that I think there is a have-not have dichotomy, but it's not at all economic. I think that's your point. Economics has nothing to do with it. It's you could almost argue that it's a tyranny of English. Thing. That the problem is not that the computers cost so much, but that so much of the World Wide Web is in English. But Alta Vista translates into six months. Let's have another one. Technical Warrior solutions. Row yes. three, Dave. Um, two questions. Quick question. Terence, you said earlier, you said uh, the way to guarantee our existence is to make us indispensable to our fellow man and therefore we can perpetuate. Boy, it seems like that's what Microsoft has done with Windows 95, that it has become indispensable. Therefore, that says that the market will win and become guarantee our evolution. That's one question. Well, let me answer okay. it. It's not indispensable to me, and my son tells me, uh, because I use Macs, and my son tells me I should grow up. And that's, I use Unix. Well, that's the good news. My son tells me I should grow up and learn Unix and stop being a crybaby about it, that the future is Unix. And Unix is free. <laughs> so there you have it. Next question. <laughs> if, if governments, um, historically, uh, our societies, our nation states, have been built around real estate and property and physical things, and if in the case of the... Cyberspace, there is no time, there's no place, there's no boundaries. Then, if governments do appropriating, then all of that's gone. Who will be doing the appropriations in cyberspace? 
Well, I don't think it's a problem we'll ever have to face. I think uh, that what's happened is we're one way of talking about this millennial shift or this cusp that we're at is this is very similar to what happened a few hundred years ago in the early 17th century with the Thirty Years' War. Uh, in 1619 to 48, there was an enormous rearrangement of European society. At the beginning of that period, Europe was ruled by popes and kings. At the end of that period, it was ruled by parliaments and peoples. And what we're really seeing and the, inter- and the World Wide Web is part of it, is the end, the crack up of the nation state, which is a spatially localized property-based concept. The World Wide Web is not owned by the nation states. It was built by them in the Cold War, but it is now an entirely owned artifact of, of global capitalism. And global capitalism has essentially said to the nation states, keep your cotton picking hands off of this. We own it and we need it to do to make money and we're not interested in negotiating it. So much in the same way that the church went from being all powerful at the close of at the beginning of the Thirty Years War to being told, run hospitals, feed poor people, and stay out of our way. We'll take we the nation states will take over the profit making enterprises. Now the nation states are being told repair highways, run health programs, preserve wetlands, and stay out of our way because this is our game and we created it. Is this good or is this bad? You can't talk about that. There are good things about it and bad things about it. It's an enormous change to a new kind of way uh, that human beings are going to do business. The virtual corporation is the is the organizational model uh, for the future. I think and the internet makes that possible. I have one quick point and one question. And the point is that to me the amazing thing about the web is not the fact that it's possible to interconnect all of these different computers and and therefore people, because that's a magnificent technological wonder, but it's an understandable technological progression. The main thing that is really astonishing is how much people want to do that, you know, that people actually want to put that information out there and they want to connect up with one another. I'm not that surprised that someone who's got a problem is interested in going and looking for a solution, but how about the guy who's got the solution and he's taking a lot of trouble to put his solution out there for everybody else? And I think that's really the amazing part about it. Um, It might echo to what you were saying about spirituality and technology connecting up to some extent because the spiritual need to connect creates the technology to do it. Um, Then the question, though, is that other than the web, whether there's any other reason to look at at the year 2000 as being anything in particular, um, you know, any, any epical change, and one suggestion for it may be that we might be coming to an asymptote when it comes to rates of change. I mean, things are changing so much faster, and the rate of change of change is going so fast that perhaps we're reaching some sort of asymptote where we as a, as a, a species are simply incapable of changing any faster and keeping our sort of collective sanity, and maybe that's really what the, the point that we're approaching. Yeah. Well, there's a loophole in all of that, though, because... One of the things that our technology holds out as a promise is the possibility of downloading ourselves into circuitry. Well, in practical terms, because we operate as we sit here at about 100 hertz, when you're downloaded into a 200 megahertz machine, you're going to discover that five minutes is an eternity of experience. And so, in a way, what digitalization of consciousness, if it's possible, means is a kind of pseudo-immortality or an ability to prolong the experience of being experientially to infinity, though natural lifespans would be unaffected by that. But somehow it seems to me that we've suddenly ascended to a world of science fiction and fantasy. I mean, I never took this downloading idea seriously. That's uh, a bunch of fuzzy thinking nanotech people or something. You don't believe that, do you? 
Uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, in other words, isn't, I mean, is isn't, a, spacecraft isn't a human organism essentially uh, uh, the download of DNA into uh, a kind of virtual existence made out of proteins? Well, whatever it is, it is, but I don't see it being reproduced in silicon anytime soon. No. Well, this is just a question of the of our differing opinion at the rates of change in a field about which neither of us know anything. That is true. <laughs> that never stopped us before. <laughs> but I think that there is uh, something essentially interesting in this um, question, and that is about the altruism of putting the information there. See, it's like a free exchange. It's like the flea market without any exchange of money, without any expectation of reward other than the, the trade. You see, this is the very definition of altruism. Somehow, against all indications, we actually see altruism on a massive scale breaking out in the, uh, in the entire planet. I mean, this is amazing. All these hobbyists have got the same hobby, and that's giving stuff away. We've arrived at, what do they call it, the Kwakiutl Indians? The, the potlatch. The potlatch. We have an informational potlatch, and more than anything else, that makes me think there's a paradigm shift. This is really something we haven't seen for a generation or two or three. All this giving away with the hope of getting back like, actually getting back like only more, is wanting it to do more, is like an explosion of giving. It's altruism, unsuspected, amazing save the world better than promise keepers, it's here now, it's altruism in cyberspace, and it makes it so much fun. Give, get, it's all the same. It's fantastic. That's actually happening. This is quite apart from uh, everything.com. This is everything other than everything.com, is I know how to feed this fish, and I'm putting it out there, and when I want to look and get some answers out there too, the plethora of information, the speed of putting it, the asymptote, I don't know. There seems to be, um, it's possible that the acceleration is actually slowing down. I mean, I don't, I don't know about the asymptote, but I think the altruism is one of the newest things to come down in a long time, very much like a new religion, like early Christianity or something. And what is the goal of it? Where is the Christ that is decentralized Altruism, but it's the resonance of all the same thing. All these people, uh, I don't know how many, 50 million web pages now indexed by hotbot.com, 50 million web pages being given away of essentially new information published freely, free publication, and no time delay. This is the acceleration which has been a quantum leap in speed of exchange of information, but that I don't think we'll be accelerating further all that much. I mean, there'll be a lot more pages, but the timeline between thinking it up and putting it out there, it actually